So cars, uh, what would be the heart of a car? Well, the engine. Oh, then what would the drivetrain be? Um, it's at least like a close the, second the, or an equal. If you have no drivetrain, the, the drivetrain would be like the muscles. Oh, the mitochondria. Muscles. Mitochondria. That's not bad. Mitochondria. Yeah. Or no, I guess the engine could be the mitochondria too, but it's just the the engine is the cardiovascular. It's the cardio. It's the it's the pulm. Yeah, uh, cardio. Um, the pulmonary cardiopulmonary system. Sort of. Uh, it's also the digestive system, obviously. Oh, the heart and the digestive systems, so. and the lungs. Yeah. The breathing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. lots of the core organs, and maybe there's. Yeah, a... that's why engines are so cool, and mm -hmm. it, and they are alive, you know. Yeah. In They're a nightmare. <laughs> They're a nightmare. Yeah. Fucking love them. That's why EVs fucking break my heart. Speaking of hearts. Fuck that <laughs> shit. Oh, fucking scams. Sorry, no old man's Kelly. Look, I've given it a go. To do with them. Let's <laughs> see, what did I do with mine this year? Uh, plugged it in. <laughs> oh, wait, I filled up the windshield washer fluid. Mm -hmm. Check your what? tire pressure. <laughs> I did that. Don't forget. <laughs> you know, when the winter came around, sure. <laughs> you don't want to lose, lose kilowatts per mile. <laughs> But yeah, it's kind of boring. But it's a good kind of boring when you don't want to work on cars. Not in the winter. Yeah. There's so, just there's just something so I nihilistic just, about. EVs. I just read really about thief working on cars, and that's enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I get enough there. <laughs> Secondary stuff. Um. Mm -hmm. I've worked on a car, too. I don't need to anymore. So a car without an engine or with any sort of engine failure or obstruction, then the car's just a shell. So what could be the engine of uh, of resolutions, of relationships, of individuals, of your psychology? Of interactions, what's the engine? experience it's all love whenever you're confused just say love yeah, that's easy answer <laughs> <laughs> wonder yes love and wonder she's learned <laughs> the shortcut answers <laughs> frankie what experience experience yeah like um... the engine of is experience how so Oh, hang on. I didn't think I'd have to explain my answer. <laughs> it might be close. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, if how you grow up and people around you and I suppose your own personality, how you become, I don't know, resilient or... Um, I need a coffee first, Steve. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like to I think oh, it's geez, it is hard actually. Yeah. Yeah. Life without experience, what would that be? Sharing experiences. That's part of relationships. Uh, 
new memories. But is that the engine? <laughs> or is it part of the engine? Is that the whole engine? Or one part of it? We'll go with parts. Sorry? We'll go with part of an engine, I suppose. Part? Okay. <laughs> and then we'll go with love. No. <laughs> By engine, do you mean what makes it go? Uh, well, for the car metaphor, your drivetrain is what translates the, the engine onto the wheels and, and to make it go. So we're trying to say what the the what processes the power, what uh, amplifies the fuel or the digestion and uh, collect collecting uh, and transforming uh, with a gasoline engine. You're taking gas, uh, air, spark, mixing all that up. In addition, to having a cooling system and all this stuff, and then that gets shot to the drivetrain, so it converts it into power. So that might be the the difference. Mm -hmm. Something that converts I, I get fuel into power. Somewhere in here would have to be perception, right? Perception. Yeah, it converts everything that we think we know into some kind of action. Uh, into action. So you perceive things through your senses. I'll go with that. Let's play there. You take in s stimulus and your five senses or more senses are reading your environment. And then does it instantly turn into action, or is there other mechanisms? Or... Oh, yeah, I think there's a lot of mechanisms in between there. Uh -huh. Even when you don't see, when you don't see physical action, that is also an action too. Yeah. When you don't do anything, is also an action based on the perception. Is there any decision in the process taken? Stimulus, information, read your environment. Is it always just action, or is there a decision, or is there any sort of? What? No, I think there's always a decision. Sometimes they're not so conscious, though. Uh -huh. Autopilot. So perceptions, uh, decisions, and action. That's a bit more complete. Or it's a bit more. Now it's a bunch of words. That's the downside. <laughs> Is it all love? <laughs> no. Is it all wonder? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's not working. Mm. Probably a lot of fear. Oh, fear. That's not bad. A lot of fear. Fear is linked to what impulse? Is fear linked to anxiety? Yes. Oh. Anxiety. What if anxiety is the engine of humanity? Mm. <laughs> or anxiety is linked to consciousness. It does seem like it's pretty connected. Anxiety. What did I say anxiety was way back when? <laughs> Let's see if it connects or not. 
What does the purpose of anxiety from April 24, 2021? Joy. Joy is the what? <laughs> Engine. Yes, Brene Brown hates anxiety because it's so powerful. But I will fail. But EMDR can get them there. Bring up the memory. And then yeah. he'll feel it because when he got triggered as a child or with the partner, he held back his feelings. He stopped oh. feeling using anxiety. So anxiety is a tool where you can separate from core emotions. Oh. Next week, not this week, but it's, an, it's a tool that allows you to separate from core emotions. Because if you cried or got angry at your parent, that means your livelihood is cut. So you supersede your core emotion, numb it out, dissociate from it, separate yourself from the core emotion, from your trauma, using anxiety. Hmm. Anxiety is and a you've meta just emotion. Jumped on, you've just jumped on to next week, right? So I have to attend next week now to figure no. this out. A meta emotion. That's an interesting pointer. Okay. Next week will probably be a total fail. Because oh, I'll be upset because the Neocon probably won't come back. So I won't have a second chance to try to double bind them. I'll be distracted by that. No, I'll be back. <laughs> so EMDR helps you balance the two emotions. And okay. the idea is to integrate your core emotion, integrate the unresolved mm. group, integrate the trauma. Integrate whatever your inner mm. child. Because if you don't feel viscerally, yeah, gravity, visceral gravitas. If you don't feel it with weight and in your body. It's stuck in time. It's dissociated. Stop. Time distortion. And all you feel yeah. is anxiety. Anxiety is on the surface of all your trauma. Right. That's why really? you're hypervigilant, paranoid, anxious. Oh, what did I say? Does anyone so see it? See so you... <laughs> Trayvon. So you're saying that we use anxiety as a tool so we don't have to feel the emotion which may necessitate a react some type of action oh that's not bad <laughs> so if you didn't have anxiety uh -huh. you couldn't stop your impulses or drives and then you would act out <laughs> or you would relive your trauma so anxiety could be a tool that would allow you to uh, stop and restrain yourself or restrain others using anxiety. Hmm. Wow. So it is sort of linked to limiting action. So it sort of does it work both ways. <laughs> so anxiety can well, be sort used of to sort of block the engine or Maybe it's more of a break because you need breaks and you need uh, you need to manage the power because <laughs> otherwise yeah, if the engine like goes red line and burns out, the power is worthless. So you got to have you got to regulate that engine to refine the power <laughs> to deliver it and to make it efficient and uh, productive to make it last. So anxiety could be a mechanism to slow down power, speed it up. Uh, tweak it. Anxiety is a reaction, to, a reaction to lack of modeling of self-regulation of emotion. <clears throat> a reaction. A reaction to a lack of modeling. That seems like that's a bit of a double negative territory or... So. 
how can you have a reaction to something that's absent? <laughs> that's more a de developmental issue. So you could have more anxiety due to developmental lack <laughs> of knowing how to regulate emotions. Would you care to add any tweaks to that definition? Uh, I think I'm challenging the reaction part. Yeah, I don't mean reaction from psychological, like a, like it's almost like a visceral, physical reaction that you stuff your emotions and you don't regulate them because that's what's modeled to you. So it's like a physiological reaction. Uh, it's a stuffing mechanism. Is that a type of anxiety or is that all anxiety that automatically stuffs expression? Well, it's like you can't, you're, like you said, you're, it, that what was modeled was you're not allowed to express because it's dangerous so that you learn to stuff it or manage it in a way. And then, like you said, it comes out as anxiety. So that, that's what I mean. It's like a stimulus reaction kind of thing, physiological. Stimulus reaction thing. So it's a uh, stuffing, it's a repressing or depressing type energy. Yeah, I would say so because you're not, the environment is not allowing you to feel your emotions, to learn how to self regulate. You're not able to express. So you have to stuff them because it's dangerous and you, you're not allowed to express them. And then it comes out as anxiety because that's one of the most basic forms of expression. You can't really have the whole rainbow of expressions of emotions. So you just feel anxiety. So if it's a denial of expression, how is anxiety different from depression? Because or I is think it's one of the anxiety that's over time that's become so autopilot that you just are automatically depressed, denying all expression. Well, for me, depression is kind of like a not even feeling anything and and then anxiety is kind of like depends on the on the situation, the stimulus that's presented. So, I mean, if if you were modeled with a bad relationship growing up, then you know having relationships might be anxiety provoking, or being in certain social situations might be anxiety provoking. But depression is more of a global thing where you you know, just the way you carry yourself, not necessarily in a relationship, you might not be expressing your emotions or feeling them because they're trauma based or so on. So, so I'm sensing that helps the mental model you're presenting has a bit of a abstract triangulation. Okay. Uh, we've been doing some other work with ISTVP and recognizing defense patterns. Uh, if you get lost, uh, Ask to ask for clarification, or, uh, or say you're not following. But uh, so, if anxiety is repressing or stopping uh, expression, um, and if you dive into a relationship, and anxiety gets uh, activated, comes up. What's the healthy way out? Are dealing, dealing with the trauma, feeling your feelings. Feeling your feelings. Okay. Being able to express them, learning how to express them, having a model to you. But you're in a relationship and anxiety comes up, maybe because other people have expectations put on, on you, or mm -hmm. the relationship has certain demands, social demands. 
So how would you be able to feel your feelings and express yourself when you have to keep up with the demands of the relationship and your old patterns of, of expecting other people to try to model or stuff your feelings? Well, you would have to work, you know, work on your own emotional self-regulation, any trauma that you had and you know deal with it so that when that situation came up that you would be able to handle that situation so this current situation i'm having a relationship with you and you're having a relationship with it mm -hmm. would you say that's accurate yes and do you think my questions and the group listening to your statements is creating expectation For you, Anthony, is sure, your anxiety social, level being any increased? social situation would create? Yes, but I'm saying this one, like a right response. Now. right? This one right now. Yeah. And then now that if it's increasing your anxiety, how are you managing that increase of anxiety right now? I don't, you, I don't understand. You gave a mental model <laughs> that said relationships bring up anxiety because mm -hmm. you learn in the past. That's where you learn anxiety as role model. That's where you started. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is a relationship, isn't it? Yes. And I, because it's a relationship and I'm asking you questions that require responses and behaviors, is that increasing your anxiety? Yes. Okay. And then as it's increasing your anxiety now in this current moment in real time, how are you responding to that increase of anxiety? By engaging in the relationship. How are you engaging in the relationship by saying, I don't understand and just also making a statement <laughs> didn't you say you're supposed to feel your feelings and work on your trauma where is that happening now by engaging in the relationship are you engaging in the same patterns you did in the past where you stuffed your emotions i'm sure like yes so the patterns continuing Right. So your mental models of how to manage it is not actualized in embodied skill in, in embodied skill that you can do something different in live fire anxiety right now. Sure. Because I'm not, I haven't succeeded in in doing it properly. Oh, that's a good question. Why do you think? What's what's the struggle there? Seems like you I have a good model of what you need yet. to do. <laughs> Seems like you've learned. Yet. Oh, you have to wait until you process everything and then you can dive into relationships and. No, I didn't. I don't feel. have to process everything. I have to process it enough. And how do you evaluate when you reached enough? I'm not sure I can self evaluate. I think I would require other relationships to, to give me a. To give me feedback i'm giving you feedback right now what's my feedback to you it's not <laughs> i'm not there yet yeah and then what does that mean to you what's the action plan after that to keep working how doing what doing this doing other things <laughs> So here's a teaser. We've been walking through the triangle conflict without pointing it out. From ISTDP. 
So there's anxiety, defenses, and unconscious feelings. Let's see, 12 minutes. So trauma could be here, unconscious feelings, emotional flashbacks. Anxieties over here. Unconscious anxiety. And then on the surface, if anxiety is able to be tolerated and kept in the heat so you can access the trauma, are all the unconscious defenses. Superego, projection, repression, isolation. Could intellectualization be like superego and isolation or dissociation? Definitely. So if you're intellectualizing, your strategy of intellectualizing and saying you're going to work on your trauma is actually getting you away from the anxiety. <laughs> what if anxiety is a doorway? <laughs> that you have to go through to feel your feelings and get to your trauma. Mm -hmm. 100%. Are you following this? Yeah, I'm following. So you're, you have the target here. What if the intermediary is you have to be able to stay with anxiety with other people in relationships and you have to do that first have you do you understand my counter do you remember yeah, what you course. stated earlier what was your earlier yeah. premise what was your earlier formula yeah my earlier formula was into like intellectualization a defense and dissociation not going through the anxiety I remembered your earlier formula said that you had to work on this stuff on your own. <laughs> and then when you worked on your traumas and feelings on your own, then you would be have more capacity to meet people with anxiety. Did you say something like that? I also said through relationship too, not just on your own. You said that too, but you said on your own also, right? Right. I said both. Okay, why are you making that difference? Because I think I, I lived with this defense for such a long time and I realized that, as you're saying, it has to be through relationship to feel anxiety. I sense a bit more energy in you, so maybe we've acted a bit more, activated a bit more anxiety. The pace of mm -hmm. your responses are a bit more faster and a bit. Uh, less smooth, less polished. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I agree. Mm -hmm. so, so, Trayvon, go. I have a question. This is very interesting and it seems like it has a lot of potential to be very helpful, at least to me as I deal with anxiety. But um, if the if the this triangle diagram here and, and just and I do believe and try it is to acknowledge that the you're in an anxious that you're in an anxious state, right? And that that's just the state that you're in. You that's where you are. But I, when you mentioned like being able to um, work on it with others, you also have to be in a safe space where it's okay to work on it with others. You know, I, I think that's part of it too, you know, because sure. there really is, there really is, I, I could just speak for myself, but you know, there really is no way to s effectively stop the anxious state, you know, the breathing and all that. So that's real nice is slow it down a little bit, but <laughs> at least for me, it's still active and, run, and I can feel it running in the background, right? So, but just being able to stay with it, um, I think it really requires a safe space to do that. Well, let's see with this simplified chart. 
you have your trauma, okay? <laughs> and then when you have awareness of your trauma coming up or you have expectations from other people, your anxiety gets triggered. And then Trayvon, you're talking about a safe space to try to quash the trauma or lower the trauma. Would that be just... at the defense side <laughs> or would it be at your repressed feeling side? Which direction would you be going with these angle, with these arrows? Okay, well, I don't know, because I think I honestly, it would be nice to know how to, how to not repress it, but to, to, it's a very painful state to be in. So it's not a desirable state to be in. It'd be very nice to be able to figure out some way to smooth it out so that it's not so intense. I don't know what direction I'd be trying to go into except for making it stop. <laughs> so if you want to do it alone, I'll make an argument that you almost have to do it with a defense. By becoming defensive? No, intellectualizing, squashing the anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. making sense of it, making a new rule, uh, mm -hmm. triangulating by projecting a third party, uh, all kinds of ways of trying to get distance or squash or control the anxiety. Those are all defenses. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is that you can't self-contain anxiety. And anxiety is a warning sign that your trauma might come up and flood you with a, a memory and make you act stupid. And so you have to stop your trauma from coming up. <laughs> so when you have anxiety, you stop the anxiety <laughs> because anxiety means you might lose control. You see the formula? So that's a one, two, three. <laughs> if your anxiety gets too high, you're worried you'll be flooded. And if you're flooded, you're not reliable. So you create defenses to contain your anxiety. And that works in social situations. But the load, the cost is you have a bunch of unconscious trauma that you keep carrying. And then you work on the unconscious trauma alone. And then you border yourself around with super ego injunctions and saying, I'm going to work on it in relationships. But when you get triggered in relationships with an anxiety, you forget all those rules and you go back to a defense. That was sort of my angle at trying to guide Anthony to that point. But this is a tricky argument because a lot of uh, mental health and self-help is not as precise at the dynamic of this one, two, three presentation. I'm trying to point it out to increase your ability to stay in conflict. If you stay in conflict more, your anxiety is going to go up. I'm trying to get you to stay with me in anxiety. It's a softer way of trying to lower your conflict aversion, raising your risk appetite. Are you able to follow? Some people are nodding. Yes, this makes a lot of sense. Because when I'm in that space of conflict and I know that I'm going for my aim, then my self-trust is building and I can hold it much easier and the anxiety is still there, but it's not that bad anymore. I feel I have more space than for that. Otherwise, the, the, the anxiety is sucking me into the conflict. But if I can hold more, there's more space between that sucking in and 
Yeah. How are other people digesting this? I'm concerned about the heightened conflict. Good. And Share it. Speak it. Yeah. Counter it. Because put it to words. Yeah, express so, it. Like Anthony's saying, you're supposed to express it. I tried to get him to express it and I got more mental models. Maybe you can express your fears better. Yeah, oh, because, express your anxiety. That's what I'm inviting you to yeah, do. So <laughs> express that, your anxiety yeah. about higher conflict. But because and even though I, I do believe that, the, you know, face conflict and all that kind of stuff, but when there is anxiety on board, yeah. to me, I just have to speak personally, the conflict can be heightened. Like it could be very, Tense. very aggressive. And, right? and so then I'm concerned that now I've hurt somebody. And that's going to cause me to be anxious too, because, because I was trying to, just let it all out and now i've hurt somebody that's a whole that's like i'm on a wheel now like i'm now i'm anxious about what i've done to somebody else's emotional state because of my emotional state so that, that be yeah that's the grief? Uh -huh. right so now i can you know so i'm on i'm on a whole this is this wheel you know because on a wheel. Uh, okay because i didn't and, and then go back to the defense because I didn't control myself because I didn't, you know, figure out a safer way for me to be anxious and not cause harm to other people. Well, you lost control. So anxiety was a way to con monitoring your anxiety and controlling your anxiety was a way to keep your unconscious feelings from taking over. Right, because I see anxiety, the way you explained it earlier, is self-preservation, right? Because I could explode, right? But my anxiety <laughs> kicked in and said, okay, this is, I'm going to keep you safe. <laughs> You're not going to feel those emotions so much. Or even though, the anxiety, I don't know what's worse, the anxiety or the emotions, but Aha, anyway. That's a good point. That's good intuition. <laughs> you don't know what's worse because anxiety has now become equally as painful or worse or a big price yeah. as the as the, um, the negative emotions right mm -hmm. yeah so the whole thing about you know leaning in the conflict and embracing the conflict and just i don't know i, I think from yeah i'm that would just lead to more anxiety and guilt and you know. uh, because leaning into the conflict would raise your anxiety levels and if it raises your anxiety levels it raises the odds of the feelings taking over. Ah. Oh. That's why you don't have any more risk appetite. Isn't anxiety like a survival mechanism? Like back in the day when we lived in tribes of say like 30 or 100 or depending on your beliefs how man was created, but anxiety was to identify risks like the tiger or your social standing within the, the 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 tribe or the clan because if you were obviously eaten by the tiger you're dead if you kicked out by the clan you were you're dead oh. um so it wasn't anxiety designed to identify all the the different risks like if you look at anxiety logically it's actually like a survival thing um I don't know if that makes we, sense. We sometimes not, use I, that definition and that it's definition. sort of linked. Uh, I don't know if it's the orienting mechanism, uh, which is us, which anxiety might be part of your orienting mechanism. Where are you in space and time? Where are you in social status with the tribe? <laughs> Where are you in relation to potential dangers? Isn't that something that helps you orient? And also, where are you to get your target? So that's an orienting mechanism that lets you hunt or get fruit. So that's a broader uh, instinct. Anxiety might be a sub-trait of the orienting mechanism. And the anxiety we're talking about here 
is anxiety about your negative emotions, about your trauma. And it could be transferred to anxiety about other people's negative emotions. Because if other people act out in their negative emotions, conflict goes up. And if conflict goes up, your risk appetite might get flooded. So your an internal anxiety might go up because up, you recognize the odds of somebody else's anxiety <laughs> means more conflict, which means you have to contain your negative emotions more. So it's using orienting mechanism, awareness, consciousness. But in this unhealthy form of conflict, or in this, actually it works, it's not unhealthy, but <laughs> in this form of containment, the unconscious feelings stay unconscious, and there's a price. The price has been pointed out by Drayvon saying she didn't know whether or not the anxiety or the unconscious feelings was worse. Are you able to follow, Frankie? For the most part. <laughs> it's Let me still process early. it, but no. We'll, we'll yeah. try to Just get some the models. <laughs> Steve? Val? The, yeah. Hi. So the not knowing of if the anxiety is worse or the feelings are worse, that's just to keep you from feeling the feeling. I mean, that's the threat of the anxiety. That's unknown. Uh, you feel the feelings and then you might get taken over and then you'll feel guilt because you might hurt somebody and then you feel grief because of it because the rage takes over or the, yeah. But there's an awareness by Trayvon that the anxiety ends up being just as bad as the negative feelings. Or she didn't know which was worse. It's hard to quantify anxiety versus unconscious feelings, but you still typically fixate all your behaviors on the anxiety that gives you a sense of control. That's why people are conflict averse. That's their shortcut to avoid conflict. Because conflict creates pain, rage, guilt. Chantal saying no all the time. So that's conflict. <laughs> if she had more anxiety, she'd play nice and be like the old sister instead of being like this nightmare new sister. <laughs> so somehow her conflict appetite, her risk appetite became bigger. So now she's able to contain her unconscious feelings and her different opinions and express it more. So that's creating conflict in her relationships. So yeah, how did Chantal... That makes a lot of sense because I really have so much more conflict, also with my friends, like over some silly, stupid stuff. Yeah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Silly, I, I thought stuff. I was just getting really difficult, but this is really normal what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you learn to enjoy. Not housing. All the masks uh -huh. come off because we have to play dirty. Yes. How much fun is that? Girls fight dirty. Yeah. Uh -huh. All the masks uh -huh. come off because we have to play dirty. Yes. How much fun is that? Girls fight dirty. Not housing. So she learned to almost enjoy conflict there. Enjoying roughhousing led her to see the mask come off and led her to enjoy the fun of it. So then she sort of disarmed the excess anxiety she had about expressing rage or uh, acting out when she was able to somehow transform that into fun. Because she was able to 
assert the need for her space. And so instead of getting smothered, she said, Please, some space. Please, some space. Please, some space. Please, some space. Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. I want it. I want it. I want it. So somehow she was able to express her rage and her need for space. And she was able to channel her aggression and her her desires so she didn't feel unprocessed guilt. Guilt turned into the ability to respond, the ability to take action, the ability to control her will, which no one guessed even though it was on the bottom. (laughs) People don't like to see clues. So back to the question, (laughs) what is the engine of humans or relationships? Let's see what Davinlu said. (laughs) Davinlu kept saying repeatedly in the training was this, you know, the the patient's will is the engine of therapy, right? It's the engine of therapy. We're making sure that's what's driving. The patient's will is the engine of therapy. That's what's driving. Now, sometimes we see uh, ISTDB videos, we'll see, wow, the therapist is going so quick. Why is he doing that? Well, if in the opening minutes or the opening session, you really got the patient's will online, therapy goes much easier. He has to understand what the problem is. He has to understand why the task can make sense. So what the problem is and why the task makes sense. So the argument I was trying to make, I think, was that most people end up trying to control anxiety. That's where they put their willpower. Because by controlling anxiety means you don't get flooded. Because if you get flooded with anxiety, then your unfelt trauma comes up and you act stupid or you act uncontrolled, maybe you won't be stupid. You're probably entertaining, so you're probably wrong. You'll probably have more friends if you let your unconscious feelings up. But you're just so, it's so unknown, that's why you, you, you and you're so used to it. So you spend all your willpower <laughs> trying to control your anxiety with a bunch of defenses. <laughs> and that works for you. So I took the time because I I wasn't able to do it faster because I'm a loser. So, <laughs> And it's a hard thing to describe what the problem is because we're so programmed on the triangle of conflict to automatically avoid conflict and try to manage anxiety that our true feelings and our raw expression uh, end up being secondary. We say we want to get to it, but we never get to it. So what the problem is, was I was trying, I was trying to describe how that's working. And then I was trying to describe the cost. And then the task would be to go in reverse. So instead of trying to monitor anxiety, you need to find a relationship to hold anxiety and face fear together with somebody that you trust or a container or a group or some medium mechanism to allow the anxiety to stay high so then you can express and feel your feelings so that you can become Chantal and piss off your siblings because now you're different and you're saying no all the time. So what the problem is and why the task makes sense. Yes, understand that it's going to be driven by his will. That's what's driving. So you get that really set. So your will is already driving. The problem is that you have unconscious defenses. (laughs) When you have conflict, your defenses come up because conflict means anxiety is escalating. And if anxiety escalates, that raises the risk that you might act out and and be exciting. 
and being exciting is a mortal sin. He must be a slave. So. Your, your will is already playing defense first. So I have to invite you and present to you to make a conscious choice to will something different. But it has to be your will, not me. If I override your will, then I'm doing the work and then the pattern will continue in new relationships because I can't be next to you all the time. up yes the therapy is going to go much more smoothly the patient's will is the engine of therapy so if mental health is therapists and self-help all those people are usually conflict diverse is that pretty and spiritual people how many of them are conflict high? <laughs> so if you're around a bunch of people that can't uh, tolerate conflict, <laughs> that can't handle anxiety, then how can they help you get change this pattern of triangle of conflict? <laughs> how can they help you feel your feelings? How can they help you express your rage? How can they help you get over your guilt? <coughs> so have we defined the problem? Or are people still confused? Or Well, the regulars have been, we've been building up to this. So. Well, but the I new have a people, question. Yeah, Trayvon. So based on what the gentleman was just saying there, you know, the engine of therapy, are we saying then that this leaning into conflict and being able, it allowing you to be able to feel your feelings, which is, you know, ultimately what we need to do, but that safe environment is happening inside of a relationship what? I, yeah in a relationship with a therapist because i could see how that you won't have many relationships left um, because most people are conflict averse right we're not um, the average person is not going to tolerate that for too long the average set of people in your life are probably not going to tolerate that person is going to be like I, I don't have time for that not looking so we say most conflict. people are conflict averse. Oh. Would you say most like five year olds are conflict averse? No, but I think that Would you most, say most, most teenagers are conflict averse. But I think most people in adults are conflict averse, right? Most professionals are conflict averse, right? Um, yeah, so this is kind of weird that kids right, and so teenagers are conflict averse, but suddenly when they become adults, they've lost this ability yeah. to deal with conflict. That is kind of weird. Or it's just like, I think I, I lead a team of people. And I, I can, I know people on my team who are not conflict averse, right? So they're ah. just not gonna, right? So, so, and everybody dreads when they walk in the room, right? So they're like, oh my gosh, well, this is gonna be forever. We're not gonna get anything done because this person's gonna pick fights with everybody. And, they, and they're leaning into conflict, right? And- um, Well, they might be leaning into <laughs> conflict, but are they leaning into, staying with their anxiety so if they're they projecting be if they're projecting their issues and arguing and fighting with people that's still a defense <laughs> right so yeah so i'm just wondering like where this is like how it, it it looks great as i'm looking at this model but as i'm going through events in my mind and scenarios in my mind i'm wondering how this fits into everyday life is this something that you should do in the safety of a therapist because it can be it can alienate people in just ordinary life uh, 
Well, that's your worry. You're making a counter argument that in the past, expressing your rage and guilt or acting out alienated people. Didn't help. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I think, yeah. I think that, you know, as I, yes, that's what I'm saying. I could see, and and then, and that's like maybe a thing with me, right? From my past and in, in my upbringing, right? But I, I guess I could also see that in my, I could see people who didn't get promoted because they don't know how to. So if I control. threw you into a boxing ring, and you had no boxing experience, no practice, uh, and uh, I put you up against somebody who was uh, skilled, how would you do in a boxing ring? Well, I wouldn't do too good. Well, Yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't do too good because I would immerse you in too high of a skill level. <laughs> right. So typically in boxing and other sports and other uh, domains of skill, you practice in sparring and simulated conflict and simulated intensity. And then as you get better and better, then you can do it in a boxing ring. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's a good analogy. So, okay. So you need to find people that are not just conflict comfortable. You need to find people that are conflict coaches almost where they're able to Mm -hmm. tolerate anxiety and give you gradations of it. That would be like therapists and coaches. Uh, There's many therapists who suck at this. (laughs) <laughs> no, yeah, as you just said, and, and that's true about religious, religious, you know, turn the other cheek and all that. Yes, those Never. are just more defenses. Right, exactly. They exactly. reinforce you to be scared of anxiety or to be scared of fear. <laughs> but the price is you deny your expression <laughs> and you let your soul starve to death. Which feel ba- feels bad, but if you stuff yourself with sugar and opiates, it doesn't feel so bad. <laughs> uh, so intensity is sort of the issue. Instead of conflict aversion, we also we can't tolerate intensity. We can't tolerate increase of anxiety, and we need some practice. Um, Practice things like disciplines. So let's see what Pierre XO says. Let's see how Richard Bannon looks after our recent insights. I thrive the best when there's conflict. Right. I I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but even if it's simulated conflict, it brings out the most hardworking, like determined, ambitious side of who I am as a person. Yes. I mean... So what is this weird thing? Conflict brings out the most ambitious, determined side of Dear XO. And then watch Richard Grant and generalize it. Teacherify it. Intellectualize it. No, injunction it. Is he going to injunction? <laughs> injunction it. It might just be something natural to us as human beings. When you're in conflict with somebody else or you're opposing somebody, you are engaging a muscle emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, that you otherwise don't have to engage. And they sort of throw you into relief. As your enemy, they throw you into contrast. Is that intellectualization? (laughs) Verbalizers. See how soothing it is to listen to a verbalizer versus the simple presentation of Pierre. Let's see. I thrive the best when there's conflict. Right. I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but even if it's simulated conflict, it brings out the most hardworking, yeah. like determined, ambitious side of who I am as a person. Yeah. See the difference? That's very specific. It's personal. It's an actual experience he's describing. And he's not sure. He's not saying this is absolutely working. 
He says, I'm not sure if it's good or bad. This is like, he has wonder. Because <laughs> he's talking from life experience, maybe. Update the clock. So let's skip the intellectualization or part of it. Battle with a discipline that will better you individually. That's Humans good, are good confrontational mm -hmm. and we're violent and we need conflict in an enemy. Mm -hmm. But I think, generally speaking, the healthiest way to do that mm -hmm. is with a discipline in your own life that will allow you to grow mm -hmm. and progress. Mm -hmm. That doesn't involve pee pee poo pooing on your neighbor. I almost want to just be like, before I get into any discourse with somebody, they have to have a discipline. So here's a clue. Having a discipline, a discipline might allow you to have a simulated conflict or confrontation with some environment. Like my random discipline of trying to figure out how to cook with a stainless steel skillet. That's my confrontation. And I'm struggling with that. But I can see my progression, and then I get to see personal self-esteem satisfaction if I can improve it. And yeah, joining in a community and tracking your progress, that's also a community, a discipline, something you can track progress in. Maybe that's more advanced. A personal discipline of a music or something, some skill, gardening, that places you in confrontation and conflict, <laughs> where you're getting a, a real feedback of that discipline to evaluate yourself. And it's something that you can express your aggression and your focus on. You can build the muscle of tolerating conflict, channeling intensity and discovering your true nature. If you want to escalate it, even better, you might want to find a beneficial adversary. I think everybody needs someone like that, who knows you and knows, and knows when you're not being yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a beneficial adversary because you have someone there who can help you calibrate your, your aim as a consequence of continued disagreement in some real sense, because there isn't much difference between disagreement and thinking. What so somebody who can reflect back to you to keep you in, invite you in a more anxious state, a more state of accepting the conflict of where you are and where you want to be, <laughs> where you are, or where you think you are and where other people see you as accurate feedback. <laughs> and not just that, where you want to be and where other people think you could be, that could be a conflict. Sometimes your friends would expect more out of you because they can see what your potential is. So if you're being a wuss or a wimp and they can see more out of you, they'll actually call you out and increase anxiety in you to try to get more authenticity or to get you to deal with and express your unprocessed trauma. Let's see if Jordan Peterson verbalizes more. What keeps you sane, this friend of yours, this agent you had, he was part of what kept you sane. And so having these disagreeable people around who say, you know, you're not being who you are and you're not who you think you are and you're not aiming properly. That's actually how you stabilize your identity. And so identity is actually socially negotiated. If you're healthy, identity is socially negotiated all the time. And in that has to be a fair good leaven of criticism because it stops you from getting above yourself if you're fortunate. 
And so you have to listen to how other people define you. But then we, you run into the adulation problem, perhaps. And now he's having fun just talking. There is an injunction there. <laughs> you have to listen to these rules, because that's how he's managing his anxiety. Because surprisingly, or not surprisingly, Jordan Peterson is highly conflict-averse. <laughs> that's why he has these strong arguments to try to make sure he can avoid conflict. <laughs> That's why I care so much. A person who's not conflict averse, they'll just share their opinion. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. They just <laughs> say stuff and piss people off like Chantal. <laughs> and then if you listen too much to how other people define you, well, that's its own egotistical trap. They're perfectly willing to tell me when they think that I haven't conducted myself according to the standards that I would like to abide by. And it's unbelievably useful while navigating a complicated situation. And it is, in some sense, the definition of sanity, right, is to have enough feedback around sanity. you that's balanced so that you move forward on the right path. Man, that was tiring. <laughs> Maybe this is better. It's only a minute. Ray Dalio. One of your beliefs is that everyone should know each other's principles. Well, here are the benefits of it. When I share my principles, I can also say, are they right or wrong? Are these the ones we can live by? That's a culture. How you're going to do something makes up the organization's culture. When we communicate and we say, here's how I would do this thing, and here's why, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Is there a better principle? Should we change it? Should we modify it? Because we just want to produce the best result for, to achieve our goals. And we want to do that in common. And also, we understand each other better. What is most important to you? And how do you go get it? And what's most important to you? And then you could see our people walk in the talk, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that makes a clarity. Because it... Okay, that's fast-paced, but... <laughs> Talking out your actions and getting other people, justifying why you're doing something and what the goal is and asking other people to justify their actions and their principles and uh, how that works. And then switching to the target of saying, is this the best way to do it? That's a, a nice way of building a bridge. That's sort of building an alliance. So having some sort of practices to try to, what's the unmet need? What's the principle? What's the goal? And let's talk it out. Compare and contrast. Stay in that conflict. <laughs> and then get above the conflict by having a bigger goal, having a shared goal, having something that both people are willing to suffer, uh, sacrifice and suffer in the short term for the bigger goal. Negotiating versus if you're just conflict averse, you'll play it safe, they'll play it safe, and there's no greater goal. Let's see. So, how do we get out of this? Uh, this might be a bit of a jump, but maybe not. We'll see. It's a complete respect for a separate mind and separate will. Is this helping differentiation? Absolutely. Allowed to have a separate mind, a separate will, separate ideas. And what is that? It's a very graded way of looking at anger. At so this is a bit of a jump. <laughs> Separate will and separate uh, mind is at the start. Expect for a separate mind and separate will. Is this helping differentiation? Absolutely. I'll so this is a bonus. This is a way, a systematic way, a precise way towards differentiation. And it doesn't need 
the Sam Vaknin protocol <laughs> of yelling at your superego of another voice to try to deactivate your interject and somehow that gets you to differentiation. <laughs> that guess of a protocol that I didn't, I haven't seen anyone do. <laughs> Here's something a bit more step by step that includes uh, will and separate mind. So the foundation is respect for separate mind and separate will. Is this respect for separate mind and respect for separate will? And that's difficult. Because with Anthony, I wanted to give him a separate mind. That's why we talked it out. But his mind had been programmed by all the intellectualizations and superego stuff. So I don't know how much he shared that was his actual separate mind. Most of it was just defenses. So it wasn't even a separate mind. That's where you have to spend a lot of time and patience and build trust to get people to slowly share their separate mind. And then not just that, I would have to respect it or someone else would have to respect it and not enmesh with his mind, give him space. That's where Chantal's pointer. Please some space, please some space, please some space, please. Differentiation means space. There needs to be space for separate mind and separate will. And that's more precise than saying safe space. Because if safe space is just what you feel as safe, that changes at any given moment. That, and you might feel unsafe because you're feeling a flashback of unsafety. The space might be safe for you to feel that, but since you're feeling your flashback, you will project your unsafety onto the space. That's a crappy pointer. So you need a space that allows respect for separate mind and separate will, which will allow you to differentiate. How's that for precision? And now anxiety might go up because like, oh, oh fuck precision. That means I need to take action. Let me go to intellectualization and make things better. <laughs> Because there's a part of your will that doesn't want to heal. It's very comfortable with the status quo. It's very comfortable chasing healing forever. Because you don't trust the process. So that's why I'm taking time to slowly, gradually do this and present this. There's no rush. Most people in this journey are spinning wheels for 20 years. So there's no hurry. <laughs> Foundation, respect for separate mind and separate will. This is a path to differentiation. It's helping differentiation. Absolutely. Allowed to have a separate mind, a separate will, separate ideas. And what is that? It's a... And separate ideas. There's a third thing. <laughs> you have permission. You need a space that gives you permission to have separate ideas too. That's pretty good. I agree with that. What is that? It's a very graded way of looking at anger, at aggression. Aggression comes... And somehow that's linked to aggression. <laughs> Imagine that. What is the utility of aggression? It comes from the Latin, ad gratis, to step forward, to step forward. Aggression means to step forward. Aggression might be part of progress. Aggression is moving. Maybe it's moving forward. If you're conflict averse and you're anger stupid, that means maybe that you can't step forward. Would your life be a bit frustrating if you can't move forward because you're scared of conflict and you can't express anger? and you can't use your will 
You're only using your will to put a brake on your engine to keep your life going in circles. To stay in defenses, to manage the anxiety, and you got no gas, you got no juice, because this is too exciting. Expressing your unfiltered stuff, that's just too exciting. Being boring and safe is much boringer. That's more authentic. You guys should stay there forever. But back to aggression. Created step of aggression. This is a, a different way of looking at differentiation. If I say no, if I say I disagree, I'm stepping forward as a separate person. So interestingly, with our fragile patients. And that's what I was rewarding, encouraging Trayvon to say her differences, to step forward into the ring with your will and your separate ideas and your separate mind. So you get used to aggressing in a baby step. Some people need baby steps. Some people don't need baby steps. They just take a giant step and then they fall down. So they take like 10 steps forward and then they'll regress 12 steps backwards and then they'll go 20 steps forward. And it's much more exciting, but... Most people need baby steps, but uh, you know, the fast ones are also exciting. So stepping forward, that's aggression. Intensity, that's aggression. Our first kinds of pressures to aggression actually are not about anger. They're a way of uh, looking at aggression, but through in a graded way, as Deep just pointed out. Great way of looking at aggression, stepping forward as a separate person with a different person. All right, so we notice. So stepping forward. As a different person with a different person? Is that what it is? Forward as a separate person with a different person. Stepping forward as a separate person <laughs> with a different person. That's the formula. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> Isn't that what's missing? You need to step forward and share your separate ideas, your separate mind, your separate will. You can do it in baby steps or you can do it in giant steps. I don't care. Giant steps are more exciting, but some people can't handle that. <laughs> then you need a different person to step forward with, to step as a separate person. That's the one, that's the formula. That's all you need to do. Just do that over and over again, and suddenly you'll be differentiated. Frankie, confused? Too easy? Muted? Still muted? <laughs> yeah, still confused. Uh, um... Look, I'll try and summarize real quick to, uh, to show how blind I am with this, but to disagree, to to follow your, to be honest, like just to disagree or to agree, um, that releases anxiety a bit and also makes you individuate, which I don't know is good for your mental health. That's what I'm understanding. Or have I got it completely wrong? It helps you be mature so that you can, you build the muscle to see this is me and this is you. And also, what is us? If you step forward and there isn't a different person there, you aren't, you aren't in us. You aren't in a relationship. So if you step forward alone a bunch, then you dive into a relationship that's a different environment. You'll go back to your old patterns. So you need someone as an intermediary. 
you need someone to contain a different person to help witness your separate personhood. Your aggression, you're taking steps of asserting yourself. So you can create a new pattern of how to relate with people. Or you can learn that relating to people with your differences is safe. You have to do that through experience, through embodied, repetitious experiences of exposure repeated over time to create a new social map. How's that land, Thank you. Yeah, it lands well, but um, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I think it also, well, maybe this is just my little thing, but being like a, a strong, um, uh, you know, like a heavy set strong male, a um, bit of a knucklehead looking, uh, if I were to get even a little bit annoyed, it's um, very easy for people to kind of freak out around me and try and contain it. And I'm not even that upset. So I, I've pretty much learned and mastered that. So you might take shut and keep calm. 10 steps and freak out people. One step. Like I just have okay, to get yeah. a little One bit One step for you, but for other people it might seem like 10 steps. Yeah. It's like, yes. And I'm so thinking, they, geez, I haven't, out other I haven't even warmed up the engine yet. You know, how is that? contradicting the path for differentiation uh no I'm this just is a path of a graded myself. path of sparring so you have to spar in a simulated environment a practice environment yeah. a yeah. courageous safe enough environment with someone yeah. that can help witness with you as a different person Gra gradual levels of stepping forward so that then when you're in the real world, it'll be regulated and socially uh, more fluid. Right now you're describing a situation where in the real world, you're, you're mismatching other people where you're flooding them or scaring them. Yeah. Yeah. So you need a simulated sparring situation with somebody else in a relationship. So they can be a proxy to the real world. So you can build up more nuance in stepping forward and expressing yourself. Like Chantal's using her sister. Cause I'll use history. Kelly in the after party. Yeah. And you can use Kelly and then through <laughs> repeated time. This is a graded way to get differentiation. For people that want a black and white instant way of memorizing crap, uh, go to Richard Grannon or uh, tons of other people. They'll give you a, a quick fix thing that, that you never figure out. <laughs> Many this... therapists are conflict averse, so they can't do this. Yes. They're going to reinforce your defenses. Frankie. If, um, there was a lady, I don't know, if I wasn't paying attention, but she kind of said something that hit home with me is that I'm also worried about how other people, and I know this probably isn't healthy, but like how it affects other people. Like, um, are they upset? Like I, I get anxiety from causing any sort of, is this I don't know, a, not all the time, but a lot is of this the time. An idea? of a potential future occurrence no, of like a potential happens, future like risk. Speak up or... Yeah. Are you imagining a future situation, a future danger? That I've hurt someone if I say something? Yeah. Is that yeah, an imagination? Agree. If I like the person, yeah, okay. I don't want to... No, I mean, right now when you're talking, you're giving a story. Is that story imagined? Uh... Is it happening now? No. Okay. Is it happening in a simulation in your head that you're putting into words based on past experiences? 
but right yes. now you're simulating the yes. future. Okay. Yes. If you're simulating the future in a story, that is triangulating, and that is projecting. Okay. Projection. You don't see the projection link. I understand the projection, but not okay. the triangulation though. What? Me and you are talking, and I'm trying yeah. to triangulate with the story of uh, John Fredrickson. Oops. So that's the triangulation I'm inviting you to join. You're countering with a triangulation of a future projection. And that counter is like going, oh, what if this danger happens? I have to think about this potential danger and not consider what Deeth is trying to triangulate. Do you see? Uh, right. Now, why would you do this? You would do this probably because your anxiety is going up. <laughs> because I'm presenting an alternative view that's a bit foreign that you don't trust, and it's a bit great graded and slow, so your anxiety might get triggered, and then you'll go to your go to defenses. One of them is projection, imagining some potential danger in the future. And you'll fixate on that triangulation instead of my triangulation of trying to present this point of view. And when anxiety's hit, you're triggered, you can't think, you can't consider. So I'm in my defense at the moment. It, what all you care about so that's what is managing your anxiety. You're not, your defense is trying to manage your increased anxiety. So I'm calling out your defense, yeah. pointing it out. Hopefully that'll allow you to contain more anxiety or it might lower your anxiety. So you don't need to be so defensive. Because this stuff happens in the now, in this relationship I'm having with you, Frankie, and what I was trying to have with Anthony, but he doesn't trust the group or doesn't trust me, which is very small. He hasn't been here for a while, and I didn't have enough. He hasn't probably has been following. So, real change happens now and continually. And then, what was the formula? Separate. Stepping as a separate person with a different person. So when you were going into your projection, you were not allowing me to be different. <laughs> you were inviting me into your sameness. You see how autopilot the defenses are? <laughs> you see how you haven't differentiated? That's the problem. <laughs> so it has to be baby steps. That's a lot it's, to process, but yeah. It's not I, just I, you I'm, being separate with a separate idea of a different person. It's also, you have to be a different person with me as a separate person stepping out. It has to be reciprocal. You don't have to do all the work. The therapy and the container does most of the leading, but eventually it's reciprocal because you're going to wrestle against it with your counter will which we didn't get to talk about. Most people have counter will. That's the compliance and defiance game, which is an older video. But stepping out as a separate person with a different person. Right, so we notice as soon as you have this separate thought here, it seems to make you anxious as if it's against the law to be a separate person. Yeah. Is that a right you'd like to reclaim this right to be a separate person here with me? Mm -hmm. And as you do that, yeah, what what feelings get stirred up as you let yourself have a different point of view here? See, in that case, even if you have a fragile patient starts to disagree with you, that's actually progress because they're allowing themselves to say no, they're allowing themselves to have a different point of view, building the... So, me encouraging a different point of view, but also me encouraging you to allow me to have a different point of view. It's both ways. That's differentiation. 
And it's me saying, this is just a different point of view. You can keep your old point of view. We are, we're trying to neutralize the danger that's associated with difference. <laughs> Our society is so groupthink that just being different triggers a lot of anxiety. Capacity to tolerate anger, to tolerate anger. Yes, and def yes, it is like holding their hands step by step as they move forward and lead from their differences, as they dare to reveal a different mind, a different. And then you would start leading to your differences. That'd be a higher gradation. That's a goal. You guys like goals and you want to project onto that. So <laughs> you can eventually lead from your differences. You can take your projection and play with that if you want. An opinion. Well, I, I disagree. And what do you notice feeling as you give yourself that right to have a separate mind? You're helping them deal with the anxiety of, dis of differentiation, but that also means the anxiety of saying no, of anger toward a tyrannical father. Often these patients grow up in families where differentiation was forbidden. No, you're not allowed to be a separate my, a daughter or son. You should be my clone. You should think what I think, desire what I desire, feel what I feel. And then the child thinks, oh, it's wrong to me, me. And so when the patient comes to you, they immediately submit to you. They don't realize they're submitting. But we have to be just kind of aware of that. And so we ask, and is this what you want? Is this what, where you would like us to go? What tells you? Now the patient gets anxious. They don't understand. Yeah, something about us finding out, yeah, what you want. Yeah, seems to trigger anxiety. So if it's against law for you to declare your desire here in the relationship, yeah. So a simplistic formula saying just list what you want and go for it is kind of simple-minded because for codependents and abuse survivors, being free expressing your wants raises anxiety that was danger. <laughs> Trying to force yourself to chase your wants is just a future landmine you're going to blow up yourself in. But during the 30-day challenge or whatever you might do, you could fool yourself into you know, some fantasy super quick change because you have no patience and your sense of time is all fucked up. <laughs> and, you know, just say what you want and do what you want. Seems like it makes sense in your head. But that would actually uh, try to blow up your anxiety, <laughs> which would trigger stronger defensive reactions. Kind of stupid, but... On the surface, it doesn't look like it's stupid. But I have no right to move forward unless we know that this is really what you want for yourself. It's a very graded way of looking at anger, at aggression, to step forward. Stepping forward as a separate person with a different person, building the capacity to tolerate anger. Stepping forward as a separate person with a different person, tolerate anger. Aggression, step forward. And... It's sort of that simple. So, one fast way of stepping forward, shortcut, you guys like shortcuts and we'll end on this. Why do you curse so much? For a guy who doesn't need to. Because I only believe in authenticity, it's how I talk. Like when I think about do I care about my employees, it feels more like in my brain and my heart and my soul, do I give a fuck about my employees more than do I care about my employees? That's how my, that's from my brain and heart to my mouth. I am willing to deal with the ramifications of me being my full self. Do you curse at home? A ton. In front of your kids? Yep. I'm just not devastated to go into my fourth grade like teacher and, and Mrs. Thompson's like, you have a real problem. I'm like, what's that Mrs. Thompson? Your daughter curses. I just don't see that as a real problem. Me and Mrs. Thompson just don't see the world the same way. Again, I'm the byproduct of Difference. Mrs. Thompson telling me my whole life that I would be a failure. Yeah. Mrs. Thompson thought that a D in science was going to be my downfall, just like she thinks saying fuck is her downfall. I don't agree. Saying no. 
It's not my concern. It's not my concern. It's not my concern. That's your problem. That's your problem. That's your problem. Ania Khan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. Ania Khan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. Ania Khan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. Ania Khan. Ooh. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. How Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.